Good day. This is uh, Professor Resnick again, and I want to uh, continue to develop this uh, Marxian value and surplus value theory that you're reading in uh, Capital, uh, Volume 1. So we want to examine a bit more carefully this notion of abstract labor that we talked about last time. Okay? Suppose it takes four hours of abstract labor to produce an apple, and suppose it takes four hours to produce a shirt. All right? Marx talks about a, uh, let me go back for a minute before I just do that. When I mean it takes four hours, that that is the um, social requirement to produce an apple and a shirt. And that, we've already studied this, that social requirement, that socially the quantity, the quantum of labor to produce something is overdetermined by everything. So the politics, the economics, the culture, and the nature in society uh, shape the quantum of hours required to produce uh, a particular commodity. Okay. Marx talks about a relative form of value, okay. and I'll write it in the blackboard. The value of an apple relative to the value of a shirt. Well, we just established the common substance for both is abstract labor, so it takes four hours of abstract labor, I'm not going to keep writing it, and four hours of uh, abstract labor to produce a shirt, so it's a it, common qualitative dimension in numerator and denominator, and hence the answer is one, or one apple is equal to one shirt. And that's an exchange of equivalence, as you can see. Apple producer gives up eight and gets back eight. I'm sorry, uh, gives up four and gets back uh, four. Okay? Let me start, change it. A dramatic moment for Marxian theory. Suppose it takes uh, four hours of abstract labor uh, to produce an apple. Same, same amount of labor, but I'm going to change it now. Suppose it also takes a shirt to produce an apple. I mean, it's a silly example, but nonetheless, you can, you can think of a shirt as a kind of fertilizer or machinery or whatever. Okay? So think of it as another input. So it takes four hours to produce an apple, and it takes uh, four hours, I'm sorry, and it takes a shirt. How, am I, how, you know, how, how is Marx going to handle this? And this is the way he does it, with his abstract labor theory of value. He says, okay, in this new example now, uh, so let me erase this. In this new example, we have a new kind of production condition. It's taking uh, four hours of labor to produce um, this one apple, but it's also taking another input. It's taking a, a shirt to produce this, this same apple. Because you got, to, you know, these are your inputs if you want labors and shirts. Okay? And you can think of this now as this is the kind of, I don't know, let's call it what he calls living labor, and this is kind of the, 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 the other input, the, the means of production to produce the apple. So let's measure it now. Okay? So to produce one apple is four hours of labor, just like it was before. Plus the one shirt, and we asked that. Well, what's the one? What's the one shirt worth? What's the cost of a shirt? Okay, just like we did before. That's four hours. Hence, the value of an apple now becomes eight. And Marx develops a formula, okay, which is very useful to us. He says, look, the value of any product, in this case apples, is equal to two things. It's the living labor required to produce it, which is our assumption is the same four hours, plus it's the labor already embodied in the shirt, the other input, because you've got two inputs in. Remember, he's using an abstract labor theory of value. So he's measuring everything in this social labor, this abstract labor, the socially necessary abstract labor time. So. To produce the apple requires not only the living labor of four, but also the labor that's embodied, materialized in the other input, which in this case is a, a shirt. So now the relative form of value has changed from what it was before. By the value of an apple over the value of a shirt, now we have eight over four, which is equal to two. In other words, one apple is equal to two shirts. Notice it's still an exchange of equivalents. By construction, it hasn't changed. The apple producer gets, <coughs> the apple producer gives up and gets, uh, gives up eight, you know, eight hours, and gets two shirts, which are worth four, four times two, eight hours. So we still have an exchange of equivalents, 
but we have changed it in an interesting way to take into account other kinds of inputs, and you can do this for each and every commodity, which is what Marx does. Okay, next step on this. A change in the socially necessary abstract labor time to produce a commodity is a change in value. Just to, you know, just to think about it, uh, let's say if, if it takes fewer hours to produce anything, then the value of that particular thing is fallen because it takes a few hours to produce it. And by the same logic, if it takes more hours, its value increases. Let me put this on the whiteboard because this is a very, again, this is a very important aspect of Marxian value theory that has to be developed. And let me take the, just the easiest example that I possibly can think of. So here's our labor hours. And again, these are abstract labor hours. Here is the number of things, the number of pieces of wealth, calls it use values, that are being produced. Suppose in one hour, one hour, a person produces a chair, one thing. Okay. So let's measure then the labor hours per thing. Well, you got one hour in the numerator for one thing. Whoops. So you got one. Okay. So this is the socially necessary ab abstract labor time per thing. The thing we've been talking, the entity, the concept we've been talking about. I want to take the reciprocal of it. This is the number of use values. That's the wealth in the numerator now, divided by the number of labor hours in the denominator. So I'm just taking the upside down. Okay? So this would be one thing, piece of wealth, divided by one hour. Okay, so the upside down of this thing. This was one hour over one thing. But you know, when, because I'm using a number one, this two is equal to one. This is equal to the productivity of labor. This one is the socially necessary abstract labor time per thing. The reciprocal of it is the productivity of that abstract labor. It's what the labor hours in the denominator yield in the numerator, productivity. Okay, now watch. Suppose we have one hour, same hour, but now in the same hour people produce, say, two things, two chairs. They used to be producing one, now they're two. They're, okay. What that means is that, let's, well, let's put our numbers down. One divided by two. Whoops. So now it takes less time to produce that chair. That is, in a half an hour you produce a chair, in the full hour you get two chairs, right? In a half hour, one chair, a full hour, two chairs. So the socially necessary abstract labor time to produce a chair has fallen, but then the productivity has risen. So the workers now produce two chairs in one hour, two chairs in one hour, their productivity has gone up. But that's just an alternative way of saying that the social and necessary abstract labor time has fallen. Why do this trivia? Well, because of the following. Okay. Marx claims that in capitalism, capitalism, the society in which we live, it unleashes let's use the term we used before, the forces of production, the capital, the technology, the machines, and so forth, etc., which is a steady rise in the productivity of labor. That's fantastic. That says that capitalism is progressive in the sense of giving us more and more wealth for the labor that we have in society. I mean, I can't think of a sector in the U.S. society in which is more productive than U.S. agriculture over a long period of time. There, the productivity of labor has risen rather dramatically because the, really the revolutionary production techniques which have occurred in agriculture. But by that logic, the socially necessary abstract labor time to produce wheat and corn has fallen dramatically, which it has in the United States. So you have, on one hand, a rise in the productivity of, of labor for producing these commodities, and just another way of saying the same thing, a fall in the socially necessary abstract labor time. Marx is going to argue, argue that this rise in productivity or this fall in the uh, uh, quantum of labor, so, uh, social labor to produce something, is tied to, is connected to the business cycle. He's going to make an argument, which we're going to see in this course, that the ups and downs of a business cycle, that is the possibility of a recession, like the last three years that we've had in the United States, is connected to 
a rise in the productivity of labor. So this is, an, a, 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 this is a contradiction. This is an ironic twist on capitalism. Capitalism, on the one hand, gives us a steady rise in the productivity of labor, which is a wonderful and good thing. On the other hand, it also gives us something which is the, the terrible, a bad thing, which is the possibility of a business cycle. And, 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 and that, to entice you, that's something that Marx is, go Marx is going to present. The next step is to talk about two different kinds of labor, now that we have everything in place. I want to talk about two different kinds of adjective, adjectives that Marx places on labor. He <coughs> describes labor as either being productive labor or unproductive labor, and both kinds of labor occur in uh, capitalism. So let me give you the definition right away. Productive labor in capitalism is that labor which is productive of surplus value. Unproductive labor is labor which is not productive, not productive of surplus value. So the adjectives productive and unproductive have absolutely nothing to do with the kinds of labor uh, performed or their importance to society. That's a mistake. Productive and unproductive have only to do with whether or not that labor is productive of surplus or not productive of surplus. So I want to examine that since, since uh, uh, it's an important aspect of Marxian theory, as we shall see. The, let's consider a labor process in which a person, I don't know, paints a house or, or provides uh, police protection or does accounting or lawyering or whatever. Okay. Then the question arises, is that material or that service labor productive or unproductive? Let's just take the painting a house. Is that is the painting of a house productive or unproductive? And the answer is, we do not know. That is, one can't deduce productive or unproductive labor from the labor process itself. The labor process itself, painting a house, doesn't tell us anything about whether that labor is productive or unproductive. And that's connected to this Hegelian logic that we discussed so forth. You can't deduce anything from the thing itself. When you consider the thing itself, in this case the labor process, it's empty of meaning. It's meaningless. You can't answer the question. What you have to introduce are other non-labor processes in order to be able to answer the question whether that labor is productive of, or unproductive. And that's what I'm going to do now, but I don't want you to lose the main point. If someone says to you, after we're all done here and, and have gone through this, is uh, 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 accounting productive or unproductive, that is the labor of accounting, your answer to that is, I don't know. You have to interrogate that accounting labor to come up with an answer. And you interrogate it by examining the other processes that it occurs with. So let me give you the example of this. Let's consider a relationship between employer and employee. I'm going to write it on the board again. I'm going to make use of this. So here is my um, employee. On one end, here's my employer. And what the, what the line is, is just indicates a relationship between um, the employer and the employee. And I just want to ask the following questions. What processes occur? Now, I'm going to hold aside, um, despite the fact we did a lot of work on it, the political, the cultural, the natural. I just want to examine these few economic uh, processes. Well, first of all, between employer and employee, there's highly likely to be a uh, labor process occurring. That's certainly one of economic processes. Okay, let me consider um, one of the faster growing uh, um, uh, activities in the United States, business activities in the United States, which is police protection, guarding. Suppose that the, between employer and, and, and employee, it's a firm that produces protection, okay, protection of houses and factories, sports stadiums, and so forth. So there's a labor process here that's occurring, okay, by the employee, and the person, uh, engages in a particular kind of concrete labor, which is policing. Times the productivity of policing, and the result is police protection for, you know, for a house, or for a sports stadium, or for a business, for a factory. So suppose the person engages in eight hours of policing, 
and over the eight hours gives eight hours of police protection, PP, eight hours of policing, and so the result is eight hours of police protection. Again, it's a fast-growing industry in the States. You know, the person has a uniform, drives around, looks to make sure everything is, is, is safe, or walks around the, the factory testing the fences and so forth to make sure that the property is safe. So that's a labor process that's being engaged here. Suppose, secondly, let's call that just number one, not in order of importance, it's just a labor process. Suppose also the employee in capitalism sells his or her labor power. Remember what labor power is. So here's an exchange process. This is the labor process. Here's an exchange process in which the person sells his or her capacity to work okay, to, you know, to, to do policing, and gets a, a wage of, let's say, uh, I don't know, 75 bucks. So the person sells her, his or her uh, uh, capacity to work, receives a value, Marx calls that the value of his or her labor power, which in my case is, what did I have, say, $75. Okay. All right. So not, no serfdom, no slavery. In capitalism, people have the capacity, the freedom to sell their labor power and receive a wage. Suppose there's another exchange process. Notice this exchange process is on the input side. Labor power is an input to the uh, employer. But the employer also engages in another exchange process, which is selling police protection on the market. And suppose that that, that use value, that police protection, is sold for a hundred dollars, okay? To a, you know, whoever is gonna be the buyer um, who gets the use value of the police protection. And so the policing is sold, that is police protection is sold by this uh, employer, by this firm, and the, the firm realizes, or the employer realizes a hundred dollars of, of, of value. And that's the one, two, that's the third process, economic process. And I want to add one more, the one that Marx invented. So let me put this up here. There's a fourth process occurring, which is the capitalist fundamental class process. Let's not lose it. We discussed this in the course. Okay. Here, uh, there is a, a still other economic process, one of class, in which the, the worker goes to work, produces $100 of value, and I'm, I'm going to assume here that the worker produces 100 gets paid 75 and hence there's a profit of $25 for the uh, employer. So the worker goes to work for eight hours. Remember, that what, the, what is that? You could probably figure that out yourself now. That's the use value of labor power. That's what the employer gets. That's what's useful there. And suppose, in my example here, you know, after, say, six hours, three quarters, the worker gets paid $75, works two more hours, and gets $25. That, that, let me do that again. The worker, after six hours, gets paid $75 by my assumption, but the worker continues to work for two more hours, six to eight, producing another $25, but remember the logic now. That's what the capitalist, the employer, acquires, right? That's the use value of labor power is the total value that's being produced here, which is $100. That's the, the buyer gets. That's what this eight hours yields. The eight hours yields $100, okay? 100 over eight, okay, times. So that's what it yields, and that's what the buyer of labor power acquires and gives back a portion of it to the worker, 75 bucks, and the $25 remains, the surplus value goes to the employer. Okay, what do we got here? Okay, let's, let's conclude. We have productive labor. So in this particular case, the laborers are productive. Why? Because they produce $25 of surplus. We have a capitalist commodity. Why? Because a piece of wealth is being produced for exchange. And of course, we have abstract labor and so forth. So here's an example in which we can say that the labor that occurs is productive because of the capitalist fundamental class process, the present. We can say that it's a, it's a, it's a commodity because it's something is being produced 
for sale. Okay. Next step. Okay. So labor is productive of surplus value, um, and we have a capitalist commodity. Next step. Okay. And this is just to, to, to come back and re-emphasize this productive labor. I want to change just this. I only want to change this. And what I want to change it, and it's a good review for us, I want to change that to this fundamental class process, but to the ancient. Remind you, the ancient is the class process in which a single individual both produces and appropriates that surplus him, herself. Okay, that's different from capitalism, in which an employee produces a surplus that the employer, the capitalist, gets. In this ancient, the employee and the employer are the same person. So we, everything is the same. I'm not doing anything different here. Save for this class process, which in this case is the ancient. So the worker goes to work, sells his or her capacity to him herself as an employer, pays himself or herself $75 in wages, and that same individual gets the $25 of surplus or profit in this private detective agency in which no one works for the private eye and, and the private detective uh, doesn't work for anybody else except, except him or herself. Well, in this particular case, we no longer have a capitalist commodity. We have an ancient commodity and if you want, Marx doesn't do this, but you could say this is an, um, uh, a productive of ancient surplus value. Marx typically res reserves the question of productive, unproductive to capitalism. But most importantly, okay, for this exercise, we have a different kind of commodity here, a different kind of abstract labor, which is that of the ancient, not the capitalist. So you can't deduce the kind of commodity present in society from just looking at the exchange process itself. You have to connect that exchange process to the class process. Why? Because the class process is Marx's point of entry. I want to underscore this with the third example. In the third example, I want to eliminate this exchange process. I want to eliminate this. And I want to only consider these two processes, but I want to change this one. No more value being produced here. Consider a feudal class processes. Here, a serf does six hours of protection on his little plot of land that he gets, that he acquires from his or her lord, but is required to spend two hours of surplus. This is the necessary labor. This is surplus labor. Two hours of surplus guarding the lord's land. That's part of the obligation of the serf to his or her lord. What do we have here? There's no commodity production. There's no exchange value being produced because we erased it from the blackboard. But we still have class exploitation. Okay? So it's a different kind of class exploitation. It's a different form than the capitalist or ancient. But there's no value being produced here. And there's no surplus value because nothing is being produced for exchange, but we still have class exploitation. Once again, if you just examine the labor process alone, and if you erase everything else, you can't deduce anything about the kind of commodity. You have to connect it to these different processes in these different examples. Finally, the final example, which is that of unproductive labor. So let me go back, okay? Let me get rid of this. Let me leave that labor process on because it's common to all these examples. Let me go back here. The worker sells his or her labor power for $75. So we have this exchange process on the input side, like we have in capitalism. And we certainly have a labor process occurring. However, in this example, nothing is produced for sale by assumption. 
There's no commodity that is being produced and sold by this employer. In other words, protection, police protection, is not being produced for sale. Hence, there's no exchange value present here. And I'm also going to assume no fundamental class process is occurring as well, whether it be capitalism or otherwise, but there's none. In other words, no wealth, no, no quantum of wealth is being produced for sale. So there's no exchange value, there's no surplus value that's present in this, there's no value. Okay? So we do not have, the value added by workers is not taking a value form. Nothing is being produced for sale. Then you can ask the question, where the heck does this $75 come from? The employer is playing, paying the, the workers 75 bucks, but there's no value, like in the first example I gave you, out of which that $75 is, is coming. So where is it coming from, A, and why on earth would an employer do this? Okay. The answer is that the employer, in this case, is taking this $75 from the surplus value that the employer gets from other kinds of workers. Suppose this were an automobile company. Okay. In the automobile company, they're producing cars for sale and so forth, and the labor there is productive labor. Okay, that goes back to the first example that I gave you. But suppose the, the, the employer also needs guards, protection, for the cars that are being produced and, so, and sold, the machinery and so forth, etc. Hence, the capitalist has a condition of existence that has to be secured, which is protection. So the capitalist takes a portion of the surplus produced by those automobile workers and pays different kinds of laborers, these guards, the $75 to get the guarding. So let's put that down because it's consistent with what we did before. So the surplus value that emanates from automobile production, a portion of it a portion of it has to be given, let me uh, pause for a moment and let me get a different crayon here. A portion of it has to be given to these guards, then of course we have all the other payments as we discussed, I'll prime it, all the others that we discussed in the first lectures. So the surplus value in automobile the productive laborers that produce that surplus, okay, the capitalists then acquire it, they take a portion and they distribute it to the guards, $75, in order to get that condition of existence. So, in this kind of nuanced analysis, Marx is saying that these guards are unproductive labor, they're necessary for production, just like everybody on the right hand side is necessary. They're necessary for production to, to provide protection from the factory, but they don't produce any surplus. They're unproductive of surplus, and hence the surplus from the productive laborers, a portion of it, has to be used to secure the guarding, just like all the other conditions of existence of the uh, uh, capitalist employer. Okay? And that kind of logic the notion of working class becomes problematic because it's mixing together two different kinds of labor. It's mixing together productive and unproductive. So for example, for a union would be very sensitive, or should be very sensitive, to the two different kinds of labor, these, the, these different adjectives. Why? Because <coughs> the unproductive laborers live off the surplus being produced by the productive laborers. So for example, if the unproductive laborers wanted a higher wage, it could come at the expense of the unproductive, let me do that again. If the unproductive laborers wanted a higher wage, it could come at the expense of the productive laborers, and you would have a tension, always a tension within the union, because the union represents two different kinds of uh, laborers. Let me pause there.